Here's my take on my grandpa's story, Lost Hearts. One of the most frightening stories he ever wrote, and a personal favorite. Steve doesn't like libraries anymore. He won't even go into a bookstore if he can help it. It wasn't always this way. Before he was 16, Steve liked to hang out at his neighborhood branch. Looking through the books and magazines, or playing games on the computers, sometimes even doing homework. And when he got his very first job as night cleaner at that very library, he was really pumped. Not that there weren't any snags. For starters, the job paid only a little more than minimum wage, and it wasn't full time. The hours weren't great either, as he wasn't allowed to start until the library was closed. After six most nights, sometimes after nine, he was usually alone, working by himself in a darkened building, but even that would have been okay, except for the last snag. The librarian. The truth was, Mr. Ashton creeped him out. He was nice enough, but Steve felt he was always staring at him from beneath his bushy eyebrows, like he was trying to read his mind. Is this your first job, he asked. Fair question. And Steve had answered politely. But then the librarian had said, So, you've just turned 16, have you? This seemed a little strange, but Steve answered, figuring the guy was probably just trying to make conversation. I'm sometimes in the building after hours working. I hope that won't disturb you in your cleaning. Steve reassured him it was no problem, but really, he didn't like it. Mr. Ashton was usually in his office, not out in the book stacks, but Steve still felt like he was watching him. Not that he was a slacker, but he didn't like the idea of anyone spying on him or his work. But there were other times Steve was happy for a little company. A library can be a strange place in semi-darkness. Steve sometimes heard strange voices and sometimes saw things out of the corner of his eyes, things that weren't there when he looked at them directly. Above all, Steve wrestled with the sense of being watched, even when he knew the librarian wasn't in the building. And then there was the thing with the books. He would be vacuuming in one area of the stacks when he'd hear loud thuds coming from another part of the shelves. It sounded like falling books. And that's exactly what it was. For upon investigation, Steve would always find a pile of materials on the carpet, as if someone had taken an invisible hand and cleared the deck. Strangely, this cascade of books always happened when Steve was alone in the building, and worse, always in the same Dewey section. 364 decimal 1523, the books about murder. The only logical explanation was some flaw in the shelf, so eventually Steve told Mr. Ashton about it. Mr. Ashton was very interested. And you say this always transpires in the 364s, eh? Yeah, you know, books about serial killers, stuff like that. How very curious. I'll just make a note of my book. So I'll remember to tell maintenance to check the shelf. But whether maintenance checked it or not, the books continued to fall and Steve was by himself. But the worst were the voices. Steve had to clean several corridors in the basement, and every time he went down, he could hear whispering. The first time he made a point of checking all the rooms, he, he found no one, but noticed that the sound stopped while he was exploring, and started up again as soon as he went back to work. Sometimes he'd stop dead and listen, trying to make out what they were saying, but the voices were just too faint. Finally he gave up, but always made a point of cleaning the downstairs as soon as he started his shift. It was midsummer when Steve had the nightmare. In his dream, Steve saw himself inside the darkened library. None of the lights were on, the only illumination coming from the rays of the full moon pouring through the skylight. But in spite of the gloom, 
He was vacuuming in the stacks. Once more he heard the thud of falling books, but this time when he hurried over to the 364s, he found more than books. A girl stood there, looking at him. Steve's impression was that she was blonde, but the thin figure was so gray, so faded and insubstantial, he couldn't be sure. He was about to speak when he heard a strange, ethereal moaning. And then she was gone, flitting madly through the stacks, as if she could pass right through them. Steve attempted to follow her, only to find she had completely disappeared. And then he heard the moaning again, coming from the basement. Steve went to the head of the stairs, leading down to the lower level, and without pausing to think, threw open the door. The girl was standing on one of the lower steps. She was dead. She was clad only in a thin white shirt, with a large, blood-encrusted rent, revealing the jagged hole where her heart was before it had been carved from her body. Fixing him with her dead eyes, she raised her gaunt arms, but instead of moaning, she vomited forth a blood-curdling shriek. And that's when Steve woke up and found himself standing outside the library. His first reaction was complete bewilderment. He had obviously been sleepwalking, something he had never done before. And then he remembered his dream and was tempted to run home. Instead, finding his work keys in his pocket, Steve made himself enter the building and marching to the basement stairs, threw open the door and almost screamed. A figure stood on one of the lower steps, but this one was alive. Mr. Ashton stared up at Steve and seemed equally shocked. His face was haggard, eyes red, and instead of his usual tweed jacket, he wore dirty, stained work clothes. What are you doing here? he demanded. Well, Steve stumbled, I, I had this dream. Do you know what time it is? After a few moments, Mr. Ashton calmed down, and Steve had no choice but to describe his dream. The librarian was clearly impressed and asked a number of questions, especially regarding the girl. I'll have to write this down in my book, he concluded. They searched the library from top to bottom, Mr. Ashton taking the lower levels, but found no trace of the mysterious girl. As they left the building, the librarian asked Steve if his parents knew where he was. I doubt it, otherwise Dad would be over here looking for me. I'll give you a ride home then. Steve demurred, not wanting to cause any more trouble, but Mr. Ashton tried to insist, finally giving up with, well, be careful walking home. There are some strange people around this time of night. All the way home, Steve again experienced the sensation of being watched, and he wondered if the librarian might be following him with his car. At one point, crossing a large parking lot, he saw two figures, a boy and a girl, at the far end of the lot. They seemed to be looking towards him, and something about the girl reminded him of the figure in his dream, but they were too far away for him to see clearly. Steve was able to sneak into the house without waking his parents, but just as he was dropping off to sleep, he suddenly thought, what the hell was Ashton doing there in the middle of the night? Steve was about to find out. One afternoon, Steve was dropping off books for his mother when the librarian beckoned him into his office. Do you like your job, Stephen? Mr. Ashton asked. And when Steve said yes, the librarian continued, Unfortunately, I'm not sure I like the job you're doing. Steve was thunderstruck, but recovered to ask what he was doing wrong. I think it would probably be better if I showed you, Mr. Ashton continued. You start tonight at nine, correct? Well, I'll be here, and we can go over everything then. I could take this up with the cleaning supervisor, you know, but I don't wish to get you into any trouble. After nine, then. Good. And Stephen, I wouldn't say anything about this to your parents. Your mother, the delightful woman, was in here the other day and asking me if you were doing a good job and, well, I didn't have the heart to tell her the truth. But I wouldn't want her to think that I lied to her. 
I'm sure you can understand that. So Steve didn't tell his parents. He told Gino. I'm not sure I trust this guy, eh? So I want you to call me on my cell around 9.15. Ask me if everything's okay. And if I say, okay, you'll know everything's cool. And if this guy wants to know who you're talking to, Gino said, just tell him your old friend Gino, who you're going to meet after work. Then if he was planning on trying anything, he'll realize he'll have to change his plans. Gino, you're a genius. Damn right I am, Gino said modestly. But what should I do if you don't answer? Call my folks. Not the cops, my folks. But in the end, Gino did in fact call 911. It was dusk when Steve walked over to the library, and the darkness seemed to increase the closer he came towards the building. Library business was slow on summer nights, so Steve couldn't see any cars in the rear parking lot. But what he did see were two figures that appeared to be waiting for him, a boy and a girl. He had seen the girl before, at least in his dreams. The boy was similarly dressed, clad in a torn and blood-drenched shirt which failed to hide the dark, puckered hole on the left side of his chest. Both figures were frail, almost ghostly, but they both radiated a sense of hunger, longing, and sheer hatred. They both began moaning, the sound so awful that Steve clamped his hands over his ears, even though he realized the noise was in his head. And then they were gone. Steve quickly hurried inside, and at 9.15, Gino phoned and got no answer. He phoned the police. He was afraid to phone Steve's parents. The cops found Steve standing in the doorway of the librarian's office, face frozen with shock. Ashton was sitting behind his desk, stone dead, a look of terror and agony carved into his features, and a huge hole carved into his torso, the left side of his torso. Ashton's heart was missing. It was never found. Steve was charged with murder and might never have been cleared, but for the discovery of two bodies, one male, one female, buried in the dirt floor of the library's crawl space. The bodies were later identified as belonging to a pair of teens who had disappeared during the past five years, the period when Ashton worked at the library. Both corpses had gaping holes on the left side of their chests. Their hearts were never found. While it was assumed Ashton had killed them, the assumption was never tested in court. And as for who killed the librarian, Steve told what he saw, <laughs> and ended up spending three weeks in the psych ward. So he doesn't talk about it anymore, nor will he ever set foot in a library or even enter a bookstore. And be alone in a darkened building at night? Forget about it. The moral of the story? Who says librarians are heartless? Here's my take on my grandpa's story, The Mesotent. I hope I'll succeed in uh, producing a word picture for you. Every organization has a complaints department, and at the public library, the buck stops with me. Patrons complain about the content of books, the pictures and photographs in magazines, the lyrics of rap tunes, and the ratings we put on our DVDs. Sometimes we take specific action as a result of these complaints, often not, but each customer is entitled to a polite explanation of our decision. After all, the public library belongs to them. I had just returned from a visit to the factory town where I grew up, and because work piled up in my absence, I decided to take some home. After dinner, I poured myself a glass of wine and set to work. It took me an hour to soldier my way through the materials until there was only one item left, a picture book. The Floaters Written and illustrated by Joe Sheridan. Published by The Inmost Light. Something about the title 
and the cover illustration jarred some prehistoric and disquieting memories. The, the names of both the author and publisher meant nothing to me. Picture books for kids tell the story as much by illustrations as by words. They have a standard length of 32 pages. Most complaints about picture books concern whether the contents are suitable for children. In this case, the patron thought the pictures were too frightening, even for adults. I opened the book and dropped it on the floor. I didn't pick it up right away, and before bending over to reach it, I drained what was left of my wine. When I had calmed down, I reopened the book and, and looked at the first pages. The illustration showed a typical bungalow, such as one might find in any blue-collar town in North America back in the 1970s. But this particular house was an exact duplicate of the very one in which I had grown up, down to the identical house number, posted just to the left of the white front door. Three figures stood on the front lawn. It appeared to be fall. The grass was brown and dried, and the trio all wore windbreakers. One of the figures was me. I still remember the Toronto Maple Leafs baseball cap I appeared to be wearing. One was my father, and the third was our grumpy next-door neighbor, Mr. Cushing. The simple text read, I see the floaters got another kid last night. I went and poured myself another glass of wine. I knew exactly what was going to happen now without having to look. But I knew I would have to look. And I was afraid. I swallowed half my wine in one gulp, picked up the book, and turned to the next page. Close up of the three figures. Me? Eyes wide. Dad? Face red and angry. Mr. Cushing? Smug. Smiling. Text. Not in front of the boy. I remembered the entire conversation, now as if it had happened yesterday and not thirty years ago. Dad had been very angry about it, as he had no use for our crabby neighbor, who he called an old woman behind his back. The next pages showed my childhood bedroom, with the sports posters on the wall, my model cars, the desk where I did my homework, and comics everywhere, including the floor. Few details were visible, as the room was in darkness, the only light coming from the open doorway where Dad stood, the light spilling across the foot of my bed. Text. You're too old to need a nightlight. I turned the page. Total darkness. The only illumination in the room comes from the bedroom window. The curtains have been pulled back. The darkness, outside... Little more than a patch of gray. I am invisible, but I know I am wide awake. No text. Next page. The picture shows the front yard of our house, looking towards the far end of the street. As it is night, and this is a factory town, most of the houses are sleeping, with only a few lights visible in the windows. The street lights cast pools of illumination, which still leaves most of the street in shadow. And down at the far end, a white spherical blob. No text, but what flashed through my mind was, It's coming to get me. Next page. The illustration zooms into the far end of the street, where the white blob has now become a human head, floating several feet off the ground. The face is young, freckled, with unkempt hair and reddish eyes. I flipped through the next few illustrations, all of which show the head, the floater, sailing down our street until it arrives directly in front of our house. And as I've been looking at the pictures, I've been saying, get up, get up, run, wake up, wake up. And with a start, I realize I've been talking out loud. Next pages. The head is shown entering the room by floating through the window. I'm a mere shadow, lying in bed, sound asleep. No text. Next page. The head hovers over the bed, 
looking down at me, its expression both hungry and malignant. No text. Next page. The floater pounces, mouth open to reveal strong discolored teeth, the entire scene suffused with red spurting blood. Text. The moaning sound of a floater. The eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
just sat there trembling. I was looking at our bedroom window when I saw this face, this decapitated head, floating outside, staring in at us, and then it disappeared. And then the glass exploded, and I hear a long, drawn-out shriek, kind of an eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
as if daring her to try to make it go away. C could you? she began to ask, but her co-worker cut her off with, I think this is up to you. After all, you are the shift supervisor. Diana realized she would have to deal with this without any help. Darting around the edge of the counter, in case the thing tried to attack her, Diana snatched up the A volume of World Book and dropped it with a thud on the offensive beastie. Now you've gone and done it, her colleague said with an aggrieved tone. What? said Diana. Ah, it's going to rain for sure now. Oh, that's just an old superstition, Diana said sharply. You really don't believe that, do you? Well, we'll soon find out if it's true or not, won't we? And that's not the only reason I've heard you shouldn't kill spiders. I'm sure I don't want to know, Diana retorted, hoping to end the conversation. If you kill a spider, it makes them multiply. You get seven of them for each one killed. That sounds like a Greek myth. Diana was clearly exasperated, so the clerk decided it was time for a discretionary silence in a passive-aggressive way. Besides, she'd had her fun. Diana leaned over the world book, placed both hands on its sides, and then, with a gasp, quickly pulled it back to reveal... nothing. The laminate on the counter was pristine betraying no trace of blood or bug guts. Gingerly, she turned the book over to examine the back cover. Nothing. Could I have imagined this whole thing? But the clerk saw it, too. Diana kept her thoughts to herself and simply restored the world book to its rightful place. All afternoon, she tried to concentrate on work, but her mind kept coming back to the incident. I killed the spider. So where did it go? And, to make things worse, that night it did indeed rain. But rain was the least of Diana's problems, for on arriving home, she was confronted by an ugly and gargantuan spider, covered with thick dark hair of fur in a color suggestive of British racing green, squatting right in the middle of her dining room wall. It was an exact replica the twin of the crawly bug she had killed, or, or thought she had killed, this very afternoon. Well, what was it the clerk had said? If you kill a spider, it makes them multiply? You get seven of the beasties for each one killed? Diana had just painted that wall barely lilac, and she was afraid if she killed the spider, it would stain the new paint with cootie guts. Shoo, she yelped. Shoo, shoo, you monster, you but the hideous green apparition simply clung to the soft pastel paint, not caring to move even one of its eight legs. And then she remembered how Andy had captured the cricket and ran into the kitchen, seizing an old glass jar she was planning to recycle and rushed back, but, but the spider was gone. Diana sat down heavily in one of the dining room chairs. She was positive she had seen it, but then where was it? Could she have imagined it? Had she imagined the spider she saw and killed earlier in the day? She went into the kitchen, found the sherry bottle in one of the cupboards, and poured herself a drink. She did not believe in drinking on a regular basis, but it had been a trying day. Perhaps she was under too much stress. She was leaning back against the cupboards, glass in hand, when another of the beasties came scuttling across the top of the counter, right in front of her. The glass fell from her hand and shattered on the floor, distracting her, but, but when she refocused and took another look, the emerald arachnid had vanished into thin air. "'What's wrong with me?' Diana said aloud, her head reeling so violently she was afraid she was going to lose her balance and had to grab the counter for support. When the dizziness finally subsided, she reached down to gather up the shards of broken glass, only to find a dark green horror at her feet, calmly sipping sherry with its mandibles. Diana ran, cutting her feet on broken glass. She hobbled into the bathroom in search of both a bandage and security, slamming the door behind her. Something was rustling the shower curtain. 
For, for a moment, Diana was transfixed, but like Pandora, she had to know what lay behind. Not giving herself time to hesitate, she grabbed the head of the curtain and pulled it back so violently she almost tore it from its rings. The walls of the shower were covered with dozens of gracing green spiders. They clung to the back of the curtain as well and fell off and onto the tiled floor at her bare feet. Diana ran screaming down the hall, whose walls were a moving mass of dark, hairy green. Without thinking, she ran outside and stopped dead. Outside equals nature, and nature was full of awful things with antennas and too many legs. She took a quick scan of the lawn in front of her condo, but in the dark and the wet, she couldn't tell if it was grass or a solid mass of glistening, clambering bugs. She had to flee. <laughs> no pun intended there. She had to flee. She was bleeding, and she had to get help. And she was getting soaked. Diana jumped into her car. Fortunately, her keys were still in her jacket pocket. At the hospital, they could bandage her feet, and then she could call for pest control. Diana stopped. What could she tell them? If she told them her flat was being overrun by large green spiders, they wouldn't believe a word, simply lock her up in the psych ward. She was still hesitating when she looked up and screamed. Three of the evil green bottle spiders were crawling up the front windshield. Diana ground the key in the ignition and backed screeching out of her driveway, not even looking to see if there were any other vehicles as she oozed into the street. Her feet hurt and were probably seeping blood, but she had to get away, had to find a safe place. But where? The library. Libraries were safe places, weren't they? Maybe if she could get to the branch and lock herself at her office, maybe she would be safe there. If only she had a friend to go to for help. But Diana was never very good at making friends. She suddenly became aware she was behind the wheel of a moving vehicle and that she was speeding along through a tempestuous night. She took her sore foot off the accelerator, making herself slow down, trying to make her heartbeat slow down too. A brilliant red stoplight cut through the gathering murk. She pulled up and halted, obeying the law in spite of her panic, waiting patiently for the light to turn green. Green? For suddenly the car was full of green. Dozens, perhaps hundreds, of the British racing green things inside the car, crawling across the dashboard, over her legs and arms, some even touching her face. Instinctively, she jerked her head back and out the side window, she saw it coming towards her car, its huge maw glistening in the rain, an arachnid the size of a transport truck. She slammed her bloody foot down on the accelerator and only perceived the panel on the side of the bus. Advertising the latest Spider-Man movie, a nanosecond prior to impact. The few passengers on the bus were treated at the scene for shock, but were otherwise okay. Diana was pronounced dead. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt, one of the paramedics told one of the cops. For some strange reason, the airbags didn't deploy. Fractured skull, the cop asked. When the paramedic simply nodded, the cop added, she hit the windshield hard too. Look at those cracks, those radiating lines. They look like, like, a, like a gigantic spider web. The moral of the story, never kill a spider. You might make it rain. And never use library materials to kill anything. Here's my take on the classic, number 13. I hope listening brings you good luck and doesn't have you reaching for the lucky logger. When I first started working in libraries, it was generally believed that computerization would eliminate roughly half of all library jobs. That hasn't happened yet because automation allows staff and patrons to do things they weren't able to do before like put books on hold for pickup. Nowadays, most libraries process tens of thousands of holds. Walk into any branch location and you'll see shelves of them, 
awaiting their reader or listener or viewer. But as books don't shelve themselves, someone has to go and find them and put them where the patrons can find them. I was at such a task, computer printout at hand, when I came across the following request. Trollmond. T-R-O-L-E-M-A-N-D. 0.13.666 F-R-A. It was a totally unfamiliar title, because, despite popular belief, library staff don't know the names of every book in the collection. I was alone in the building, which wouldn't be open to the public for a few more hours. I walked over to the start of the nonfiction shelves and stopped dead. I knew the floor arrangement like it was the back of my hand, and I knew, I knew that on that part of the floor I should be looking at three long stacks of five bays each. But there were four long stacks, one more than what should have been there. I gave my head a shake to see if it would clear my mind. Were there only three units right there? I was sure there was only three, but now there was definitely four. And then it came to me what had happened. How do you like that, I said to myself. They've decided to add a whole new shelving unit and couldn't be bothered to tell me, and I'm supposed to be the branch librarian. I was miffed and getting angrier by the second. Is there anything on them, I muttered. If staff had been shifting books onto the new shelves without anyone bothering to tell me, well, there were going to be a few people throughout the organization who were going to be hearing from me. The shelving unit was completely loaded. Four of the five shelves were three quarters filled with only the bottom shelves empty. So what exactly did they shift over there, I sputtered, snatching a title at random. The book in question was bound completely in soft, warm black leather, the only decoration being the word Trollmond, T-R-O-L-E-M-A-N-D, in bright yellow gothic script along the spine. Well, speak of the devil, I said, but hopefully not out loud. Talking to yourself is a bad habit you can get into when you spend a lot of time working alone. I opened it to see what it was all about and found myself confronted with text in a foreign language, possibly German or maybe Scandinavian. I did a quick scan of the title page, but the only words I sort of understood was a name, probably that of the author, Mag, M-A-G period, Nicholas Franken. Wondering what our collection development people were up to, buying something few people could read, I put the volume under my arm and moved off in quest of the next item. I had a lot of titles to track down on my list and no time to think about anything other than the task at hand. I had just completed my first pass through the holds list when staff began arriving for the noon opening. I told Chris, the senior clerk, how far I had got with the list and was about to head off for my own lunch when I asked, when did the new shelving unit arrive? I know it wasn't here yesterday. Chris smiled but raised her eyebrows. New shelving unit? Yes, a whole other row, right at the start of the nonfiction, the 001s. Uh, a new unit? As it was obvious she didn't know what I was talking about, I told her to follow me. I strode over to the nonfiction, ready to triumphantly point towards the strange new section, but it wasn't there. I'm sorry, Chris said, striving hard for politeness, but I, I don't see anything different. I wasn't really listening to what she was saying. Instead, I was busy counting the rows of stacks. One, two, three, three lines of nonfiction stacks. Same as always. Maybe if you ate something, Chris said. I couldn't argue. If I was seeing things, Perhaps soup and a sandwich might offer a cure. When I got back after my break, my attention was immediately taken up by all the routine matters that crop up during the working hours of a busy branch library. As a result, I was ready mid-afternoon when, 
Noticing one of the staff had the holes list in her hand, I asked, Were you able to find everything? Oh, yeah. Say, did you see that strange book in German or Scandinavian? Heavens knows why collections saddle us with it. Uh, it's in German? I'm not really sure what language it's in. It's called Trollmond or, or something like that. I saw her giving the list a quick scan. Trollman, you say? I don't see anything like this on the list. Here, let me see. She watched me with an I told you so expression on her face as I ran my finger along the list of titles, many of which I remembered. It wasn't there. I took a look through all the process holes for the strange black book, but it was nowhere to be seen. I looked in the online catalog. There was no entry for Trollmond. I began to think that I had been working too hard and vowed to take the night off. If I ate a good dinner and drank a glass of wine, or two, followed by a good book and a good night's sleep, I was sure I would be all right again. Alas, it wasn't to be. I decided on steak with sautéed mushrooms and garlic mashed potatoes, washed down with Shiraz, and I was heading for the kitchen when I realized I'd left my book, The Collected Stories of M.R. James, sitting on my desk. As I was eating alone, a good meal without a good book was simply unbearable, and so it was off in the car and back to the branch. It was twilight when I headed out, and since it was an evening when the branch closed at 6 p.m., the building was in darkness when I arrived. I let myself in the main entrance, turned off the security system, and was heading towards my office when I noticed out of the corner of my eye, once again, there were four rows of stacks where there only should be three. I thought it might be a trick of the light, but when I moved closer, I realized there was nothing wrong with my eyes, but possibly something wrong with my mind. An extra row of bookshelves stood in the semi-darkness. I tried to resist the urge, but I kept moving forward. The new shelving unit was full of books, with only the bottom row bare, and before I could stop myself, my hand shot out and grabbed a thin black book with bright yellow letters on the spine. Trollmond. T-R-O-L-E-M-A-N-D. And then suddenly it slid from my hand, as if someone had grabbed it and I was running for the door, only to stop to lock it behind me, and totally forgetting about the alarm system. I had my cell in my jacket pocket, but I was so rattled I called Phil from a payphone in the nearby McDonald's. I think I might be losing my mind, I said by way of introduction. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that, came the sarcastic reply. Phil really did think I had lost it when he heard I was calling him from Max and wanting him to join me. It's something at the branch, something you've got to see. Half an hour later, I let my bemused friend into the building, stopping to turn on all the overhead lights before heading across the floor towards the start of the nonfiction stacks. And there were three units standing in rows. There was a fourth row here, I whined. Did you turn the lights on? I shook my head. Darkness can play tricks on you. I saw it, I whined again this time even louder. Didn't you tell me something about a book? Yeah, I, I dropped it. It should be. Of course, there weren't any books on the floor. There was nothing at all. Since neither of us is eaten, and you dragged me out here under false pretenses, I suggest we adjourn next door, and the beer and pizza's on you. I wasn't very hungry, but Phil made up for my lack of appetite. He was thirsty, too, and by the time he finished wiping his mouth, I was experiencing a distinct pain in the wallet. Are you still worrying about those shelves, he said, as we left the restaurant? I admit I might have miscounted, especially in the dark. But that book I dropped, I knew it happened. I wasn't hallucinating and... And what? Never mind. Maybe I could have imagined that, too. Phil had a smug and well-fed expression on his broad, swart face. Let's just try an experiment, shall we? Let's leave the lights off and see if anything unusual happens. Something did. No sooner had we stepped inside when we heard what sounded like a party, 
or at least the buzz of many voices talking. What the hell was that? Phil said, obviously and unpleasantly surprised. Eh, it's probably just the cleaners. Cleaners? With the lights out? It sounded like a... chanting. We'd better find out then. Watch your step. We moved cautiously into the unlit building, staying close together and instinctively moving towards the beginning of the nonfiction collection, where there were now four rows of stacks. There were only three earlier. I know there were only three, Phil babbled. It's worse than that, I said, pointing to the book lying on the floor. Phil went impulsively to pick it off the floor, and as he bent over to retrieve it, a yellowed, skeletal arm slithered out from the upper shelf, its blackened claws scrabbling at his collar. My friend suddenly became aware he was under attack, and turning his head slightly, caught sight of the withered appendage, and unleashed a Herculean bellow before flopping back onto the floor. I ran forward and did the unthinkable. I took my hand and pushed all the books I could grab off the top shelf. The arm was withdrawn so fast it vanished, and I was looking at a shelf with no books, no arm, no nothing. Phil scrambled to his feet and made a dash for the door, careening into enough pieces of furniture that I was able to catch up to him. We have to get to the bottom of this, I began, only to have him cut me off with, We have to get out of here! L let's turn the lights on. We're probably safe with the lights. This time, of course, we found the customary three rows of stacks. The mysterious fourth row had completely disappeared, and there were no signs of Trollmond or any other books on the floor. And that was basically the end of the story. The mysterious fourth row of shelves never reappeared, and eventually we changed the floor plan of the entire building, completely relocating the nonfiction, which I hoped would break the spell or curse or whatever caused the problem. Phil has chosen never to set foot in the branch again, while I tried never to work alone. I try, but I'm not always successful. I spent one blustery morning by myself, listening to the wind howling dismally around the building, at times sounding like the wailing of the lost souls of the damned. And once I was sure I heard faint discordant laughter off in the direction of the non-fiction books, or more precisely, in the area where the non-fiction began, the zero zero ones. I did not investigate. One of my tasks that same morning was to empty the book drop and begin checking in the return materials. It was unusually full, and as I sorted through the paperbacks, magazines, and CDs, m m my hand suddenly touched something warm, a thin black book with yellow lettering on the spine. Next thing I knew, I was standing outside in the rain, swallowing great gasps of fresh air as if to cleanse both body and soul. I hadn't looked at the title of the book. I knew what it was the instant my fingers touched it and I didn't want to touch it again. Eventually, I made myself go back inside, and when I checked, it had vanished. Just out of curiosity, I decided to check the catalog. There was no record for Trollmond or for any Nicholas Franken. Nothing. But I did get a hit for a Nicholas Flamel. Being a good librarian, I decided to investigate further and learned Nicholas Flamel had been a famous alchemist who had apparently learned the secret of transforming base metals into gold. He was also a character, along with the infamous Dr. John Dee, in a series of young adult fantasy novels by Michael Scott. Was Nicholas Franken also Nicholas Flamel? If not the same person, was he also an alchemist, one who had gotten himself into somewhat dubious company? I simply don't know. And I don't want to find out. The moral of the story? Library workers should never work alone. Especially in the dark. Here's my homage to Count Magnus. 
one of the classic ghost stories. Everyone who has worked in libraries for any time knows that libraries are often havens of the lost. Lonely seniors, the unwashed, <laughs> quite literally, and the unemployed, people filling in or wasting time. But they also know about library geeks, solitary young people who haunt the library even when they have no homework to do. Jim was a library geek. He spent every night in the main branch downtown, reading Colin Wilson books on murder or the occult, or listening with earphones to Ravel's Bolero at the listening station in the fine arts room, over and over and over again. There was even a rumor he'd listened to the library's entire opera collection. This was a geek indeed. None of the staff, not even the high school girls who worked as pages, and they were all girls back in the 70s, knew anything about Jim. He lived in an apartment with his mother, who was apparently a shift worker, and he didn't seem to have any friends. Tall, skinny, with glasses, Jim in his old green trench coat quickly faded into the background, so you forgot he was there. And so, no one, at first, noticed he had begun using the microfilm reader, or what he was using it for. Every town has its dirty laundry, its secrets it never discusses, in public. In our town, it was a series of murders which took place in 1937. Late that summer, a black Hudson Terraplane sedan began cruising the back roads north of town during the hours of darkness. Canada was still in the grips of the Great Depression and had a high population of young transients working as farm or casual laborers. If a car passed a solitary young man walking alone, it would stop and a voice would ask, Do you need a ride? And the young man would never be seen again, at least alive. Later, parts of bodies would be found in both the lake and the creek and it was eventually concluded that five young men had gone for a last ride in the long black car. Its driver was one William Magnus, who was hanged for murder at the old jail on April 15, 1938. Magnus was a servant of Dr. Francis E. Morrow, an eccentric doctor who committed suicide by throwing himself into the lake before he could be arrested. The slains had no known motive. Magnus pled guilty and went silent to the gallows. Many believed the killings were sexually inspired, but the local whisper stream claimed the young men were victims of peculiar medical experiments, which had failed. No one knows how Jim learned about the case. No one spoke of it, and there were no accounts of it in any book in the library. But the original press reports were available on microfilm, both the murders, the suicide, the trial, the execution. So he began to spend his free time reading yesterday's news. Jim bought a Hilroy Scribbler and made notes. He had decided to write a book about the murders with the proposed title, The Night Doctor. From the notebook. I doubt these were sex crimes in the usual sense. Morrow was a brilliant medical student, but considered a crank because of his theories. I need to find an MD to explain it all to me. But, as near as I can understand, he thought it was possible that individual body parts contained the spark of life, i.e. a leg could walk by itself, a decapitated head could retain consciousness, even think and speak. Is that what he wanted the farmhands for? Experiments? Were they guinea pigs? Jim tried to question his GP about Morrow's ideas, but was strictly told they were nonsense. The actual term the doctor used was sick, and he tried to discourage Jim's interest. It didn't work. Jim visited Morrow's old house on King Street, which backed directly onto the lake providing an excellent place to dispose of bodies and related parts. Jim was actually caught trespassing in the backyard, 
which featured an old concrete dock, the homeowner threatening to call the police if he ever caught him again. Jim also found where Morrow was buried in the back corner of the local cemetery and was observed by a classmate actually talking to the grave. Oh, Doc, I wish I could have met you. How I would have liked to have learned your secrets. What exactly were you up to in that house on King Street? Putting your theories into practice? Jim was already considered the school weirdo, and such reports did little to improve his social standing. As for Magnus, no one knew where he was buried, or cared. I often did my homework in the library's reference area. It was better than staying home. I had a few classes with Jim, so when I saw him at the microfilm reader, I asked him what he was doing. Um, some historical, some historical research, eh? He mumbled, trying to brush me off, which only increased my curiosity. I kept bugging him until he admitted he was looking into the 1937 murders. Wasn't that some sort of sex crime, I asked? Uh, uh maybe. Jim wouldn't say any more, but I did notice he was making notes in a blue Hillroy notebook. A few weeks later, I saw Jim talking with a few old rubby dubs sitting outside a beer parlor on the Lakeshore Road. As I was passing, a burly middle-aged man came out of the bar, grabbed Jim by the collar, and yelled, What are you asking questions about Magnus for? Uh, I'm just doing some research, Jim squeaked. Get out of here and mind your own damn business, the man yelled, shoving Jim around and giving him a kick in the ass that propelled him down the street. The Rummy's raucous laughter filled the night. As I watched Jim slink away, I thought about asking him if he was okay. But I figured he might be even more embarrassed if he knew I had witnessed his humiliation. One night, Jim decided to walk the train tracks near his apartment and took a shortcut around back of the Canadian Tire Store when he saw the car. THE car. From the notebook. April 30th. I was behind the plaza when I saw it. An old black four-door sedan. On looking at the front, I was amazed to see the Terraplane logo. It was a Hudson Terraplane. I checked the tail lights, and sure enough, the year 37 was molded into the plastic. Might even have been the night doctor's car. It was huge, and I couldn't resist standing on the running boards. When this gray man gray hair, gray clothes, came out of nowhere and asked me to get off. He was polite, but it still freaked me out. Where did he come from? I watched him drive away towards the tracks, and it sure had a powerful engine. Guy looked familiar. Maybe he lives in the apartments. Later. The gray man was William Magnus, and he was wearing a gray chauffeur's uniform. I recognized him from a news photo. It's insane, but it was him. I just saw a ghost. After this, the entries in the notebook became increasingly paranoid. May 3rd. Car followed me home. First saw it on the Rebecca Bridge. Then it was prowling behind me along Queen Mary. Had to cut through the woods to get away. We'll stick to well light streets from now on. May 5th. It's following me up Kerr as well, even though other cars and people around, even though it's well lit. I had to go into a variety store and sneak out the back to get home. I don't want them to know where I live. May 8th. Looked out the bedroom window through the curtains, 3 a.m. Car parked on the street with Magnus looking up at my window. And there were things on the street or are parts of things that crawled or hopped and looked wet and ahead, just ahead, sitting on top of the stone fence. May 10th. They've been inside the apartment. Everything wet and it stinks like the lake and, and like something else, something worse. May 11th. I've spoken to him. He called just after midnight and explained all. He offers me immortality of a type 
or at least parts of me, and before he hung up, he said in his cultured voice, You said you wanted to meet me, and so you shall, very soon. I hope you won't find it a cutting experience. Oh my God, my God, what have I done? May 13th. In the library. No place else to go. They're getting ready to close, and, and then what shall I do? Maybe I should go to the police. They'll think I'm nuts and put me in 999 Queen Street, but that's better than this. Magnus is sitting across from me, pretending to read a book. <laughs> Torso by Marjorie Freeman Campbell. But he's really just staring at me and smiling. The diary ends. Jim's disappearance occupied the front pages for several days, but then the case ran cold until his torso, just his torso, washed up at Hollyrood Park. The rest of him, including the head, was never found. The local police claimed Jim's murder was drug-related, but anyone who has read the notebook knows it had another, and a supernatural, cause. So, how do I know all this? A staff member found Jim's Hilroy notebook on the floor of the fine arts room and put it in the lost and found without examining it. Later that summer, I had the opportunity of looking through the lost and found for a pair of missing sunglasses and recognized the scribbler. So I took it and read it and then burned it. And I never did find those damn sunglasses. The moral of the story? The devil makes work for idle hands. <laughs>